So, Father, I thank you that I can just commit this word to you and I ask you that you would speak to our hearts. And I pray against any blinding spirit that would actually not let us see what's going on in ours. God, I take authority over any comparison, uh, comparing spirit that would actually cause us to look to someone else that we don't actually allow you to do a work in our hearts today. And God, I thank you that your word says that it will accomplish that for which you sent it. And so, Father, I just commit this time to you and we say thank you, Jesus, that you will speak and you will do in our hearts and in our lives what you need to do. Amen. So we're in, uh, we're in our freedom series and we're heading towards get, coming to a closing in the next few weeks. And today I'm going to be... Um, I'm going to be speaking about something that, that I feel that every single one of us I actually feel a caution because of the subject that it is. It's easy to go, oh, that's not for me. But I want to actually encourage you before we even carry on speaking that today, your mind, if, it think, if you think about somebody else, because that's easy to do in church, eh? Oh, I wish so-and-so could hear this. I wish so-and-so could be here. They so need this scripture today. They so need this word today. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes we carry people in our hearts and we really want God to do something on their lives. But I actually felt caught to caution the church that today, if you're thinking that you need to actually take that thought captive and say, God, before I think of somebody else, I pray that you would actually do something in me. So if you're, getting, if you're thinking that, you can send them the, the recording afterwards, but keep your, your heart focused. And so just to put us, just to gather our thoughts again, we've built this course around the, um, on the foundation of John 8, 36, where it says, if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And what we've said over the last few weeks is that so many Christians and, and people that know God aren't living free indeed because they don't actually believe they can indeed be in bondage. And the fact that Jesus, when he came, he came to de demolish the works of the enemy, to set people free, to bind up the brokenhearted. And, and this is the thing that we can't think that once we say that those things just automatically go away, it's, it's our, it becomes our inheritance. And, and we, I can't go over all the things that, we, that we've journeyed over the last eight weeks, but if you, if you want to join in and, and allow God to do that, you can go and listen to the YouTube recordings. But what what we need to understand is that, that there is an enemy and he is real today as he was in the Old Testament in the Bible. And that there is a warfare over your life and over my life and over the purposes that God has for you and for me. And so we started off this course with that thought that actually for us to know that we're in bondage, we actually need to take stock and say, God, is there any area in my life that I am not fully free? And the um, John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes, which is basically, if you just look at that, he didn't say the thief used to come or there once was a thief that used to come. He says there is a thief and he comes and his sole purpose is to steal, kill and destroy, which means when the enemy comes and he has a foothold in our life or a stronghold in our life, he doesn't have um, authority of your entire life where you don't have choice because we looked at the, the, the story of the demoniac that had a legion of demons, yet when Jesus came, he ran towards him and he worshipped him. It's the fact that there is ownership, but there is control. So it's like a thief that gets in through the window. You own your house, but he's got control over the area that he's functioning in. And so if you looked at your life, if there is any area where the enemy has got a foothold in our life, we've been breaking it apart over the last few, year, the last few weeks. We've looked at um, thought patterns. Some of us have been so bound in the way that we've thought or perceived certain things. Maybe something has been spoken over you as a kid and you just lived under that label or something along the line you overheard something or you just misunderstood something and it has formed your, um, your perception of how things need to be or whatever it is. And the enemy has kept you bondage in different areas in your life. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, actually, you need to stay awake. You need to be alert because it says, watch out for your great enemy. He is great. This, this enemy, the devil, the, the, the guy that absolutely hates God, despises God, he cannot touch God, but so he will try and kill his, and, and destroy and bring destruction in his children. Because why? We were created to be the image of God, in his image. And then the, the, if you were to break that down, it says us being the image of God, being all over the earth, scattered, means everybody that looks, as, looks at us needs to see Jesus. We are supposed to be bearing the image of God. And so what the enemy wants to do, he wants to taint it, he wants to scar it, he wants to smudge over it so that there is no reflection of the goodness of God in and through our lives. And so this journey over the last few weeks has been actually breaking that open for us. But today, I'm actually going to speak about something that um, is probably one, the, the number one um, sort of stronghold or, or one of the main strongholds that, that comes against believers. 
and let us say, let me move on, mature believers, people that have been Christians for a long, long time. We probably fall prey to this stronghold more than any one of the others. The other ones definitely exist. So Joel 2.9, he speaks about how the enemy comes and he rushes upon the city and they run, run along the wall and they look for windows and doors and how they can come in and penetrate. And so it's the same scripture where it says he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And so what we need to understand is that if this is something where we've allowed the enemy a stronghold or a foothold, there's some, a thought process, he's going to move in and he's going to use this against you. Because why? If he's got control in any area, there will be destruction and robbery and steal, kill, and death that will surround your life in any area. You guys okay? So what is this thing that I'm talking about? I'm talking about pride today. Because the thing about pride is that when I started thinking about that, if you had a picture pride, if I said pride, we would think possibly arrogance, we would think of a, a look, we would think of a, I'm better than you, we would think of something that was quite outwardly expressed, would we not? But I want us to actually look at how the enemy works in believers' hearts in the, in, in the element of pride. See, because when pride comes, it's not necessary that it's going to be the way we think it's going to be. Arrogant, in your face, push people away, belittle people. It actually comes in a very subtle form. And that's what I want us to look at today, where we don't actually recognize it in our own lives. So I want to ask you that as we look at this today, ask God, is there anything in me that I've actually not recognized? And so there's two people that I want to look at today. And the first person is Simon Peter, one of, our, one of my favorite characters to look at because he's so real and we can so relate to his life and his journey and trying to figure out Jesus and Christianity and his calling and who he was meant to be. But in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has come and asked me. I mean, guys, that scripture and that statement by itself is enough to do a few series on but I'm not talking about that. Satan approaches Jesus and he says, I have come and I'm asking you, I want to test Peter. And so what happened, or Simon Peter, he says he's asked to sift you as wheat. But then Jesus says to him, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. But after you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So basically, Simon, Satan has asked to come and test you. And I've prayed that you won't fall back. But when you do return, strengthen your brothers. Basically, he's got permission He's going to test you. I've allowed him to do that. But more than that, you will fall away because that means you will return as well. Can you see? It's all in, it's all in this. He, he's basically setting him up saying, this is what's happening. You're going to be tested, but I'm praying that you won't fall away. But after you've returned back, strengthen your brothers. This is what's going to happen in your life. And, and Simon Peter, he says, but no, 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 Lord, I will never deny you. I'll, I'll, I'm not, that's not going to happen, you know? Wait, I'm jumping ahead of myself. She says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison. I'm ready to die with you. Like, Jesus, that's not going to happen. I'm not, I'm, I'm backing you. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, that before the rooster crows three times, you would have denied me this same night. So the thing about this story, right, is that there's gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all have a picture that actually speaks about the same situation, the same a story that God is trying to, the same account, and they call the synopsis, is that right word? Synoptic Gospels, because they're all telling you the same stories, but from their different views. So what I want to do just for a second is in chronological order say, okay, let's get the bigger picture of what's just gone on. It's not just this random conversation that happened. We need to see where this has come from, what happened before that, what happened after that, where's Peter at, where's Jesus coming from, and so we're going to just do that for a few minutes. Is that all right? So basically what happens is Jesus says, listen, listen, Peter, Satan's come and he's asked to test you. So now we need to understand what happened just before that. So in Mark 14, if you, if you look back in, in the Gospels, do you know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not necessarily written as they happened, right? You've got to put them all together, which is exciting for some historians and teachers in this place. Jesus is speaking to them and he says this in John 14, 27. You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples. It's the same conversation, just recorded in more detail, right? But after I've risen, you will go ahead to Galilee. And then Peter declared, no ways. Even if everyone else 
Even if everyone else um, falls away, I will not. Not me, Jesus. That's not going to happen to me. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, actually even tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Then Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, this will not happen. The new King James, he actually then says, so he, he actually comes against Jesus even more vehemently, like, even like, how dare you say that, Jesus? Like, and he sort of has this conversation with him. You've got to pre feel pretty good about yourself, right? To have such authority and such an understanding to say, Jesus, this is not going to happen. Because let's read it again. Jesus is actually saying, guys, the Bible says every single one of you is going to fall away at the account of me. They're going to strike the, strike the shepherd and all the sheep will scatter. And Peter goes, that, that doesn't include me. I want to sit here for a few seconds because sometimes we read the Bible going, oh, I haven't denied Jesus or I understand that there was Peter's thing and he was restored, but let's just, let's just take a, a step back for a second. What's happening here is Jesus is saying, guys, this is what happens. More than this, Jesus is quoting scripture. He's saying, Peter, this is going to happen. Peter goes, no, God, it's not going to happen. He goes, okay, Peter, let me put it in a different way. The Bible says this is what's going to happen. And Peter still says, Thanks, Jesus, but that doesn't apply to me. Let me put it in a different way. All of you will fall away. Yes, God, but I'm not part of the all. Guys, this has got way more meaning than just the fact that Peter denied Jesus. When we have a conversation with Jesus, and when we're speaking about things, when we read his word, when we look at the Bible and what the Bible says and how he wants us to, uh, to live, and we look at scripture and we say, God, that's a good idea, but it doesn't actually apply to me. We are acting in the exact same way that Peter is acting in this, in this situation to Jesus. When he says, the Bible says, Peter, this is what's gonna happen. Oh no, God, that's not relevant to me. When we take anything out of the Bible, oh, don't lose it. When we take anything out of the Bible and we look at it and we go, God, that's a nice idea, but it's not relevant to me, or I tried it and it didn't work, or actually that's for somebody else, and we don't apply it to our own lives, we are doing exactly what Peter is doing, saying, God, all doesn't apply to me. And we exclude ourselves from that. But can I tell you that the definition of all in every single language, Greek, Hebrew, and Russian, is all. And when God says, this is for all, do you know that the Bible is for every single person on earth? That the promises that are in this word is for every single person that calls on the name of Jesus. That the blood of Jesus is for every person that allows him to, to actually give access to the kingdom of God. Every single promise in this is for us. And so when we start saying, God, that doesn't work for me, or you can do that, or I'm not a Christian, or I'm not on that level of Christianity, we are doing the same thing. When we look for an excuse that it does include, no matter how noble it looks, or no matter, no matter how blatantly rebellious it is, we are doing the exact thing that Peter is doing in this conversation with Jesus. Sorry, Jesus, that doesn't apply to me. And Jesus is saying, Peter, all means all, includes you, and it is written in the Bible. I mean, Jesus himself was the prophetic fulfillment of so many prophecies up until that point. He's like, it is written. The whole Bible is written about me. Everything points to me, and I'm standing before you. Even this conversation, you'll take all the nice things that you like, but what about the other things that God wants for you to bring us into freedom? Isn't that amazing, guys? I'll allow Jesus to do that in your life as we carry on for a little. I'll let, just let it sit there. But what happens just before this is in Matthew 16, what happened is Jesus comes and he speaks to his disciples and he says, okay, guys, there's a lot of murmur about who I am, who do people say I am, who do you say I am? So before this happens, let's look at where Peter had come from. How did he get to that place? He stands up and he says, Jesus, you are the son of God. And Jesus says to him, well done, because you didn't come up with that answer on your own. And so let me tell you, your name is going to change from Simon to Peter. And on that revelation of truth, I'm going to build my church. And he basically says to Peter, Peter, the church of Christ on the earth is going to be started through you. What we have today is a result of the promise that was made to Peter on that day. He said, I'm going to build my church on the earth and the gates of hell will not prevail. And it's going to be through that revelation that you've had. And we know that what happens on the other side. 
That's the exciting part, right? But what happens is he has this conversation. Then Peter says, so on that revelation, there's a church. There's an advancement of my kingdom. This is what's going to happen. But before that happens, I still have to do the final thing that God has sent me to earth for, and I have to die on the cross. There is no other way. Uh, there, there cannot be another way. I have to go through this process. And Peter, in the same conversation, he's just been called the rock, the, 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 the birthing stone, if you want to call it, the corner. No, no, Jesus is the cornerstone. And that's Darren's favorite song. And he's like, this is, this is what I'm going to build my church on. But you know what he says in that moment? He says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. That is the declaration and the commission of the church. Going, church, if you get this revelation, that is the authority you're going to walk in. And then he says, I'm going to die and I'm going to be resurrected and this is what's going to happen. And in the same conversation, Peter again stands up. He says, but actually, Jesus, hang on, hang on. He takes him aside. I mean, at least he had the decency or the wherewithal to know that. He takes him aside, and you know what he says? He doesn't say, Jesus, can you explain this to me? I'm finding it hard to judge. He rebukes him. He rebukes Jesus for saying that he has to die on a cross. Guys, aren't you glad you're not Peter? Pride, that was pride. So Jesus looks at him. Now, he's just called him Peter, and he then addresses him. He looks at him, and he says, get behind me, Satan. How did Peter go from being Simon that becomes the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on to be called Satan in one conversation? And then the next conversation, he says, you're going to deny me. Not only are you going to fall away, you're going to deny me and fall away. And it is a, it is a bizarre thing, but let's look at it for a second. Jesus speaks to him and he says, you know what, Peter? I bind, I get behind me saying, I'm not even going to answer you. I'm not going to entertain this because the word says, now remember, he's just said, the word says the, the, the shepherd's going to be struck and all the sheep will scatter. Peter says, I'm not those part, part of those people. Then he says, it's going to happen because I have to die and I will be resurrected and that's what's going to bring salvation to the world. And Peter goes, over my dead body, am I going to let you happen? That, that happened. Get behind me, Satan, because you do not have the mindset of the kingdom of God. You are looking at it through the mindset of a human being. Guys, this is a powerful, powerful scripture. When we become so mindful of the things that how it fits into our understanding and our situations, and that becomes our benchmark according to which we measure God, and we limit kingdom principle, we are totally practicing and functioning in an, in an element of arrogance. Peter was arrogant to think that he could actually say to God, that doesn't apply to me. And when God says, this is how my kingdom works, works, and he steps in and he goes, that's good to know, but I'm actually not going to even let that. You've got to be on another level of arrogance and pride to look at what the word says and say, I'm sorry, not even I'm sorry, I rebuke you. Imagine God says, I want to bless you and increase you, that you're, you know, all these sort of things. We go, yes, Lord, amen. And he goes, okay, forgive the person that offended you seven times over. I rebuke you, Jesus. I'm not going to forgive that person. They don't, you don't understand what they did in my heart. I, don't, I, I do not receive that. And Jesus is saying it's the same thing. Anything that the word says that will bring freedom, because Jesus came to set us free, that, we, that doesn't line up with our understanding, that we go, I'll measure that up according to my life and my understanding and see if it fits for me. We are acting in the exact same way that Peter is acting in this, in this moment. Do you know we spoke about it a few seconds ago. When Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter... He actually doesn't. He says, Satan. Why? Satan knows what the church on the earth is capable of. Satan understands what the kingdom of God looks like because he was part of it. He is aware of it. He understands from God's perspective that if the church of God would rise up and understand kingdom the way that kingdom should be functioning and what church on the earth should look like, and when we join together with revelation and freedom and the word of God in our mouth and faith in our loins and all these things, and we start advancing forward, protecting each other, and as we advance as an army in ranks, knowing exactly what it is and the authority God's given us and the freedom that he's given us, the, the damage that the church would do and the kingdom of darkness, he, he is petrified. 
So him stepping up saying, this is not going to happen is the same thing that when in our lives, when he rises up and says, that's not for you, he knows the freedom it will bring in your life if you could understand what the kingdom principle is that is at work that God wants to achieve in and through your life. And so when we're going into the new season of the church, why are we doing this miracle offering? Because for us as a church, I feel that God's saying, I need us to understand from my perspective what his church London could look like on the earth today. What your place could look like on the earth today, part of this church moving the kingdom forward. Not a, let's reduce it to, what does the church want from me? He said, you know what, if, that, if that's your attitude, then we won't achieve it. But can you perceive it? Can you see it? And can the kingdom of God be broken and burst within your heart and in your mind? I believe that God is actually calling us out as a church and as an individual individuals to a higher understanding, to a deeper revelation of who he is and what kingdom is about. I believe that we're going to move into signs, wonders, and miracles when we understand that every single one of us is something that God wants to use in his kingdom to pray for people, to see people set free, to lay hands on the sick, and they be healed right there and then. Because when Jesus promises things to the church, it is not just a nice idea to say, church, one day, I just want you to keep on pr praying that this might happen in and through you one day, but it's not really yours. He says, this is yours for the taking, but you've got to move from being a spectator, not understanding kingdom principles, to actually going, do you want to be in the game and, and allow God and what he did on the cross to be the invitation and the qualification that you can play your part in taking hold of something that would unite a nation and bring healing and wholeness and, and then just turn things that was in fear and lack into hope and future because that's exactly what the kingdom of God does. It releases vision, it releases future, it releases purpose, it gathers, it is unity because the Bible says that where there is unity, there is a blessing and God wants the church to be this in this time. And so anything that the enemy will actually bring against you to say that's not for you in this time, he's going to actually address the enemy because he knows, the enemy knows the power it will release in and through your life if we actually grab hold of what the kingdom of God meant. Amen. Amen. Okay. I believe he's going to actually change revelation for us as we actually position ourselves in the next season of what he's doing through this church. See, it's arrogance and pride. What does it look like? when we actually start trusting in our own understanding and not trusting what God's wanting. Peter was trying to say, God, I love you, and that will be a horrible thing to happen, or I can't see how that's going to help. So it wasn't an ugly, prideful, I'm better than you, God, and there's a better way. He was trying to protect him. Pride can be that subtle that you actually think about what you're feeling. You know, we've spoken about emotions, mindsets, behaviors, and that becomes greater than what the Word of God says. That's pride, guys. 2 Corinthians 10, it speaks about when they measure each other by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Let's look at another friend of ours, and I'll do this in 10 minutes, I hope. Job. Anybody read the book of Job recently? Anybody love the book of Job? Do you? Really? Look at there, there's a student in our midst. Job is a book. 30, 40, 40 chapters, how many? There's about 40 chapters, you guys can go, that's your homework, go and find out how many chapters are in Job. I don't want to say 40, I think 42. Anybody know? 42, 42, we have a winner. And, um, and for 42 chapters, it's a, it's a picture, let me just say, that wasn't his whole life, it was a season that Job went through. And for 42 chapters, there's a story of how there's this righteous man and he was unlike any other on the earth. And for 42 chapters, how this guy's life is literally pulled apart, where there is destruction, loss, hurt, crazy stuff. I mean, none of us wish to go through that. And can I just also say that you, you don't have to fear that either, okay? But let's learn from his life. So for, 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 for let's look at Job's life. This is what it says in verse one, Job chapter 1, verse 6. One day, the members of the heavenly courts were, present, were, uh, were to present themselves before the Lord. Isn't it a similar situation that Jesus is saying that, you know, here we're having these conversations. And then guess what it says? The accuser, Satan, was also there. Jesus, a father, is sitting in heaven. It's a court hearing. All these heavenly people are there, but the devil is also there. And God stops him and he says, oh, Satan, what are you doing here? And Satan goes, oh, you know, I've just been roaming up and down the earth, just looking, 
at what I could find. It's all scriptural. You can go and read it. But there's also scripture that says that's exactly how he behaves. And Jesus says, God says, where have you come from? He says, I've been patrolling the earth and I've been watching everything that's going on. This is the craziest transition. Who, look who's, who offers information. Have you ever been the person when they say, don't offer too much information? I'm that person that has to keep being reminded. Like, you don't have to give them everything. But God says, Satan, have you considered Job? Like, if Job was going to sort of not be called, like, Satan, who did you see? He doesn't even give Satan an opportunity. God volunteers. He volunteers Job. Now you're all thinking, oh my gosh, is this the God we serve? Let me just clarify. God is always good. And we can read the scripture and we can look at him and sort of misunderstand him. But if, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is not God. He was crazy. That's a little bit of an unfair thing. You don't understand God. He is always good. His ways are always good. His ways are higher than us. We don't understand what he's doing. But hopefully in a few seconds, you will see what he's doing right here. God says, have you actually considered my servant Job? You know he's the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless. He's a man of complete integrity. Who would want God to say that over your life? I would love to be that person. You are blameless, your integrity, you're, you're, you're a righteous man living on the earth. But look what happens. For 31 chapters, Job is tested. First, his kids. First, no, first his, 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 um, his oxen and his servants and then his kids and then he gets sick. And then for 31 chapters, when you, just when you think it's bad enough, something more happens. And Job, this man, starts having these conversations. He's got his three wise men around him. And for 31 chapters, Job is trying to make sense of what is happening. And not once in those places does he actually say, I rebuke you, Jesus. This is not what I signed up for. Or not Jesus, it was God in that time. And he says, this is not what I'm signed up for. Not once does he curse God and die because those are the friends that are saying, okay, well, Job, if this is really happening, then maybe you should just maybe review your relationship with this God that you're serving. And then for 31 chapters, they go through this all. They're going, are you sure there's not an open door in your life, Job? Are you sure there's nothing else in your heart that, like, why could this be happening? And Job's going, no, there's nothing. There's no open door. I'm a, I am a righteous man. I have served the community. I have tithed. I have looked after widows. I have um, been a gracious man. I'm actually really well received in, this, in, the, in the, the, the courtyards where people would come and ask for, for wisdom. People want my counsel. I am wise. I am a judge. I am, and he starts listing every single thing that any one of us would have liked to have, just five of those things on our CV. He's that man. He's that outstanding man in his community. He's got wealth and he shares his wealth. He's got sacrifices and he understands it and he's committed to it. You know, the beginning of the, the, the chapter it says he's the sort of guy that his friends, his family was a whole family. The brothers and the sisters, they would all come together and have feasts and birthdays. And, you know, it would be like Christmas, really. My Christmas tree's up, guys. And, uh, and so it's like he's living this life. And then what would happen is the morning after, he, he'll come in and he'll make sacrifices on behalf of his children just in case they defiled themselves and they party the night before. He was so committed to the things of God. He knew them all, the ordinances, the things that God required. Of, he, knew the, he knew them all. And over and over, for 31 chapters, they're going, okay, well, Job, we don't understand why this is happening. And for 31 chapters, Job is saying, I didn't do that. I don't know why this is happening. I'm, I, I just, I, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss. God, I don't understand why this is happening. All these things. And for 31 chapters, this is going on. Go and read it. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Do you know, what Job is pretty much saying is he's saying, guys, you can compare me to anyone else alive. I have done way greater things than them. There is no one else like me on the earth. And he starts listing the things that he's done. And you can read those lists. We, we don't have anything on Job, let's be honest. But you know what we do as Christians, sometimes mature Christians, if I can be so bold as to say? We start listing the things that we've done. God, I've forgiven because you said I need to forgive. I serve a church. I actually wake up early. I'm committed to being part of a team. I've, I, I look after my community. I've baked a cake for somebody in church. I've sent flowers to somebody that had an operation. I've, I've done all these things. And then, you know what, have I even tired God? God, I actually turned my other cheek. And we don't maybe think of it like that. Do you know that even how, how he responded to God in this by not even 
cursing God and die. We think of him, we can read this as he was an honorable man. How many of us wouldn't curse God and go, God, I'm out? Like if this is it, then I'm out. And we, we, actually, we actually acclaim that to Job going, that was good stuff, Job. You didn't actually turn your back on God. And we, we read it as he was a righteous man. Yes. I mean, we wouldn't have. We would shake our fists at, fists at God going, God, I don't understand. You've got to make this clear. M- maybe, you know. But he doesn't. And so we think he was this righteous man. But finally, finally, there's this young guy, Elihu. He sits around them. He's got all these older prophets and older wiser guys sitting around him. And they ask him these questions. And finally, he bursts out. And he says, you know what? I've, li- I've sat. I've listened. I've heard you. You've come at a different angle. But actually, now I'm getting angry. He says, Are none of you, can none of you hear what is actually coming out of Job's mouth? Can none of you see what's really going on here? You're still looking at all the things and the lists because you don't live up to the same standard that Job is pretty much setting for you. So you're thinking he's a righteous guy and he's doing this Christian walk really well and he's serving God with his whole heart and he's more generous than anybody else and he's wiser than anybody else and he's he's just so much better than anybody else. And so you're still looking at that. He says, guys, but can you not see this? And this is where I want us to zone in. Job 32, the three men finally stop. Because Job was righteous in his own eyes. Job couldn't see why he actually was going through this test. And he had lists and lists. He had a scroll that would go all the way to the end of the earth of all the things he could qualify himself with that he had justified himself, that had made him righteous. He's like, God, I've done all these things. I've, I've been, and, and I'm a nice person as well. And so he, he goes through this. So finally he says, actually, you don't understand. Job is justifying himself rather than God. Everything that Job did, he took as a, I'm living this Christian life really, really well. Rather than God, you've done everything for me, so what can I do for you? He made it about the things he did versus the God he served. The fact that he was blessed was because he was, he was a blessing. The fact that he was seen as a ble- uh, uh, somebody that was wise, he took that on upon because he's this righteous man and he's learned the scriptures and he relies on God. But there was a thin line between attributing everything to God versus somewhere along the line, we see it as our righteousness. Do you know that righteous living has got nothing to do with what you've done and how much you've done, but completely by the blood of Jesus. That somebody that could get up on the cross next to Jesus, not served him for one day, could end up in heaven because Jesus said, it's not by what you've done or you've not done, but today, because you've called on my name, you will be with me in paradise. It is, a, it is proof for us. We cannot sit around tables going, well, so-and-so is this, and so-and-so is that, and I'm glad I'm not them, and I've done all these things. Because what happens in when we start comparing ourselves to somebody else's Christian life, the benchmark is very low, guys. It is extremely, it is non-existent. And so when we start actually going, well, I'm glad I'm not that person, and I got that right in my life early on in Christian, Christianity, Jesus says, can I just... Can I just say, that is a root of pride in our lives. And let's be honest, we've all thought, maybe, okay, Jesus, I'm honest, I've thought thoughts like that. Thank goodness that wasn't me. And we judge people according to what we think was better and not better and how many of things we've got on our list. And Jesus is saying, guys, let me just strip it all away from you. The thief on the right-hand side of me, or of the cross, when he called out on me, he is just as righteous as you who have been serving your heart out and preparing things and serving the, the... He's like, you've got the wrong end of the stick. It is a heart attitude. And I'm seeing what it is. Do you know the Bible says that every one of our righteous acts are like filthy rags before God? more than us being unrighteous, it actually is something that stinks and it's disgusting before God. So a newborn believer who has no revelation of what's religious and what's not, he's just so overcome by the fact that there is a God in heaven and he once was blind, but now he sees. He once was lost, but now he's found. And he's just overwhelmed by this fact that he just wants to devour the word. Think about it when you first got saved. Think about it when you meet somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Will he forgive me? He has forgiven you as far as the east is from the west. And then what do they want to do? They want to go out and they want to write letters and they want to make, you you know, I, I, I stole something. I need to correct that. I need to fix that. Not because they want to go, God, I'm going to show you that now I'm saved. It's because they cannot help the fact that they have been overcome by the grace that Jesus has shown them. And yet as mature Christians, we actually start becoming comfortable and the fact that we know how to live a Christian life. 
because you know it becomes a habit. Spending time with people, being kind to people, smiling, telling them about Jesus. Do you know that you do something en enough, it becomes a habit? It's a good habit. If just, it's a very good habit, but when it becomes a habit and it's not attached to grace and that overwhelming sense of Jesus, you've done this in my life, it becomes something that we actually take pride in. I'm a tither. Why am I picking that up? Because we're in the middle of a financial thing and it started amazing conversation that actually, it's a good thing. You know, like when you have to be shaken to remember why you're doing what you're doing? Do you know those are the best times to do? Like people say, can you tell me this? Go back to the word. Why do I do this? Where's my faith attached to what I'm doing versus I'm just doing it because I was told to? See, Job's eyes, in his eyes, he had done everything right, and he had. He followed all the rules, he was esteemed, he stood out in the community, he was wise, he was generous, he served God, he served the people, he served the community, he loved his family, but his suffering was not due to his, to, uh, attached to sin. It wasn't, you know, sometimes we think, oh, so-and-so must be a real big sinner because they're being punished. He wasn't being punished, guys. Job was not being punished. There was an open door in his life. And God loved him so much to say, Job, you can live this righteous life and be so outstanding in your community and still miss the plot. There is something in your heart that you have shifted from the reason where we started to it becoming who you are. And there's a gap between that. Job's suffering wasn't due to his sin. He wasn't being punished. It was a sinful attitude in his heart that was causing a separation between who God was and what he wanted for him. Job had become proud. See, he gets to the point where he actually is saying, God, can I make my case before you? Because right now I actually don't know how much more of this I can handle. And the last part of Job is just eye-opening. I'm just going to read you a few things. It, are you guys okay? Yeah. And he finally gets to the point where Elihu, he says to him, you guys, have, you've missed it all. Job is proud. This is what's happening. He's being, he's being tested and he's being sifted because he's actually so proud and he's, he's attributed his righteousness to the things he's done and not attributed it to the fact of who God is, right? And so the last part of, of Job, finally God speaks. So for the whole 31 chapters, it's not. So verse 38, finally God says, okay, Job, you've demanded a hearing with me. And I want to say this gently, guys. Let me first read this and I'll see if I say it. The Lord finally says, he says, okay, who is this that obscures my plan with words without knowledge? He's like, Job, you're coming to me to present a case to me, yet you have no knowledge of who I am. You have no knowledge of why this is even happening to you. So let's, let's do this. If you want to start comparing yourself when you're like, I'm not that person, so I can see why it would happen to that person, but I have not done those things that other people. He's like, you've compared yourself to that. He says, but if you, were, if you really, really want to compare yourself, let's do it right. Compare yourself to me and my standards and who I've called you to be, Job. Let's start there. He says, because you're coming with a very strong argument of all these things that you've done, and then God starts speaking. He says, tell me, tell me where I laid the earth's foundation. Surely you know, Job. Guys, you know me, I can't do sarcasm at all. It comes out very, very ugly. But I get that there's parts of these things that are very sarcastic. And God's not sarcastic. But I mean, he's, he's making a point here, right? And he says to him, who marked off its dimension? Surely you know, Job, because you're telling me that you've done all these things right, and you have no idea why you are being tested and tried at this time. And he carries on. I mean, he starts speaking about seas that are shut behind doors. And have you, have you even thought about where the storehouses of snow is? I mean, guys, <coughs> you don't even have to read this to, to, to see it through the eyes of pride, but even just to get perspective of who God is, you've got, you got to go and read this. He starts talking about stuff that I've never even considered in my life. Where does the light live? Who tells it where to go? Where are the storehouses of snow where, where, that are reserved for time or de, uh, of trouble or battle or war? What is the place from where the lightning is dispersed? Where does it, like who tells the, the waves where to stop? that they don't go past their boundary on the shorelines. Who tells the mountains where to stand? Who put the stars in the skies? And he just starts speaking. He says, come on, Job. If you want to have this argument with me, then, then you need to get yourself onto my level because I cannot have this argument with you on your level. God will never reduce himself to the place where he comes down 
Hear what I'm saying with mature eyes. He did come down, he made himself a man, and he can identify with us, but he's not going to become less. When we don't understand God, and we try and put him in a box to describe him and explain him so that somebody understands him, we have made him way smaller than he is, because he is infinite, and our minds and our understanding is finite. So when he says, you wanting to have an argument, you in you finite human being created who can't see the wood from the trees, you want to have this argument with the God of creation that is infinite. You cannot come to me like this, Job, and tell me that now you want to have a, a hearing with me. And so he carries on. He says, who cuts off the rain and who does all of this? And he goes on and on and on. And just when you think Job's had enough, he goes, I'm not done yet, Job, because you had 31 chapters of telling me all the stuff that you've done, and I'm not done. Let's keep going. And he says, do you know where the mountain goats give birth? Do you know? Do you watch them as they bear their form? Do you count all the months till they bear? Do you know how everything, guys, it's amazing. You should just go and read it. And on and on and on he goes. And finally, finally Job sits there and he realizes, I am the one without knowledge. I'm the one that when God says, this is the life I have for you, this is the way I need to live, we take that as, okay, now I'm doing this, God, what are you going to do for me? That's where pride and arrogance comes in. I want to say something about tithes and offerings and giving and generosity because it is something that God is doing in the church at the moment and it's a conversation that came up do you know that when God says, test me in this, this is just what God showed me in the last few weeks that I feel like I need to sh share. It's not an invitation to say, I'm testing you. It's not a test. We cannot test God. Those words basically is an invitation, trust me with this. It's a different heart attitude. But when we say, God, you said, test me. You said, make a case. We take a position before God that is completely opposite of humility. The invitation of test me in this is saying, would you not trust me in this? Because then it's not about I did it and now I'm waiting for my return. That is a misunderstanding of God's grace and of God's heart and of who we are in, in, inside of God. See, Jesus consistently lived humble. It's a very stark contrast to who Job was. He came to earth and he said, God, all I want to do is actually bring, he was God himself, he says, but my life on earth, I'm committing to bringing you glory. Didn't matter what he did or what he didn't do. Do you know in the beginning of this course, we start the scripture where it says, when you lay hands and you, you bind the enemies and you cast out demons, you know what the Bible says? It says, don't take pleasure in that. And Jesus did more miracles than any one of us have ever experienced in our lives. He is the miracle worker. And yet he said, you know what? That is nothing compared to the fact that my name, that your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life humility. It's not about the awesomeness that flows out of what it is to be part of kingdom. It is the heart of what God wants for us in his kingdom. And so Jesus actually is the perfect example. James 4, 6 says, he gives grace generously, as the scripture says, but he opposes the proud. So my challenge is, my question is to myself as well, am I facing opposition in something that I've been doing right, according to the right way of living? And can I ask myself, honestly, is there pride that is maybe causing this bit of opposition? Because God says, if you approach me humbly, I will give you even more grace. But I oppose the proud. So you might be like Job, a list, a CV that any one of us would die for. And he's saying, okay, but then why am I opposing you, Job? Some of us have said, I've done this for years and I didn't see breakthrough. Some of us have said, I've prayed this for years, and I did, or I've tried that. There's things in my own life. I'm like, God, I thought I tried that. I thought I would. And, and he's like, okay, well, if there's opposition and you've done everything else right, maybe it's because of the attitude that you're approaching this with. Job overstated his case because he found himself more, more righteous than what he thought he was, than what he thought was due him in the way God was treating him. Let me say that in a different way, <sighs> because I wrote it down better than that. Can't find it. It will come up later. Maybe it's gone. The relationship between God and him blessing you has got nothing to do with you. Job being a righteous man and doing all those things has nothing to do with him being the guy that we read about in the beginning of Job. Do you know what happens is when Peter gets to that place where he fell away and everything that the Bible said will happen did happen, he is restored because he repents. Job gets to the end of his life 
or end of, not the end of his life, end of this, this season. And he actually says, God, you know what? Actually, I've got no more words to say. I've got nothing else to say, he says. But what I will say is my ears have heard of you. There's stuff that we've heard of. For generations, we've been living a Christian life, some of us. For months, maybe. For seasons, whatever. But if it's become stuff we've just known, I feel that God is saying, okay, it's time for you to move past what you've always just heard and known into actually, but now my eyes have seen. And then he says, God, I actually have got no, I I repent. He says, I repent, God, before you. And I despise myself. Because this is the thing. When Job actually gets to that place and he measures himself up against who God is and what he's been called to do, God, his measures are way above ours. He gets to the point where he actually says, okay, I've seen you, God. I understand you. Because when he sees God more clearly, he understands where he fell so short that it doesn't actually matter how much he could have been Mother Teresa. Think of Mother Teresa. You know, we all think she's... It's like God says, it doesn't actually matter. It is all because of me. But the thing about the, the Bible, it says this in Proverbs 16, verse 18, a haughty spirit goes before a fall, not pride before a fall, a haughty spirit, a self-seeking spirit, a, when your eyes are on yourself, like I want something, this, that, and that goes before a fall. But pride comes before destruction. If we don't deal with pride in our lives, you will be destroyed. That, and let's go back to the first thing. Oh, no, no, not me, God. I'm managing this. You will be destroyed because that's what the Bible says. And it is a warning that I believe that we as a church need to actually take hold of because it says that a haughty spirit goes before a fall, but a pride comes before destruction. And why did, why did God allow Satan to test them and sift them? Because he did. We can't say, oh, no, that's not really how God, he did. Satan came before him and he said, I demand to test them. Those are the people I've chosen. And God allowed them because there was a root of pride in their lives. But why does he? Because nothing happens outside of God's control. Because if we have to go big like that, then we think God doesn't have control. God is still always in control. Because what happens is, there's another scripture that says, hand them over to the enemy. Because when they come to their senses, they will realize who they are, what they are, and they will repent. God wants us to be restored. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. So when he allows the enemy to take you through trials and tribulations and things, it is not to break you and push you into the point where there's no return. It is actually to restore you so that you will not be destroyed. So even in Job's life, the worst book in the Bible of all the bad things. It was always for his protection because he said, Job, if you don't stop this, you're actually going to be destroyed. So rather let the enemy come in and rather let him have his way with you because he said, I'm not going to let you touch his life. But let him have his way. Let me strip away anything that you think you have done to deserve the name righteous, upright. He says, I'm going to strip that away because I need you to be restored. So both Peter and jo- jo- uh, Joel come to their senses and realize that they need to repent. See, I want us to finish today, and you can stand now as we pray. This is, this is not a, a, the worship team can come and play behind me. This is, like I said, freedom for Jesus. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And sometimes we have conversations, and if you're in this church, you know we're going to be at all access. We talk about everything the Bible talks about because if the enemy can keep us under lock and key and he can't shine a light of what God's word does say about certain things, we will stay in bondage and we're not going to be that church. We want to be free so that there is a freedom that we can bring because everything God releases to us is beyond us. It's to a nation, to a generation that are going to follow and onwards and upwards, yeah? So right now where you are, I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you, oh, let's all look around and see who's, who's really, but I know that some of us really need to just say, God, have I somehow found comfort in the righteous living I've done? Have I somehow interpreted your invitation of testing as my grounds upon which I get to stand and somehow moved out of a place of absolute overwhelming humility into a place of achievement. And I want you to just for a few minutes, we're going to go into worship. We're going to sing a chorus. You're just going to sing over them for a little bit. And I'm going to allow you to have this this moment because we can finish right now and we could all run out. But I actually really believe that God... God wants to do something here this morning. And just have your moment with him and say, God, is there anything in me 
that I might not have recognized that have moved into pride? Is there anything in me, God, that I have looked at in your word and said, I'm sorry, this just doesn't apply to me? Have I, has my understanding, when pride is when we actually rely on our own wisdom, our own understanding, and in our own righteousness. And God's saying, I need you to come back to you. It's, it's before all of that that you have been called righteous. It's before all of anything you've ever done. You are righteous because of what Jesus did. And so I'm going to just pray for you right now, and we're going to sing a chorus, and then we're going to end And you're going to go home and you're going to have an amazing week and God's going to do an amazing work in your heart. And so God, I ask you that right now, Jesus, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Truly, God, we don't want to use words that we don't understand, Father, that we've, we've, we've attached to different meanings. But God, in Jesus' name, in the kingdom realm, what humility would look like, God, where we've attached our righteousness to the way we're living, when we've seen ourselves righteous in our own eyes because we have lived up to what we thought it should be, God, and somewhere the break between everything being because of who you are and what you did for us, moving into what we're doing and the life we're living. God, whatever it is right now, I trust you, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to every single person. And God, if pride has got a foothold or a stronghold in our lives, God, the power of repentance is so much more powerful, Father God. Just as Job actually said, God, before you and before you alone, God, I am nothing. My ears have heard. But God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that as a church, as a congregation, and as a people, that our that what our ears have heard would be upgraded to a revelation of, but now my eyes see God. We see kingdom over our understanding. We see your ways be above and beyond what, we, what we, we can even comprehend or try to perceive. But God, I pray that you would do that shift. You would do that breaking over people's lives. And God, because we know that as the enemy would step in and say, this is not for you or over my dead body, I'm not gonna allow this. And we start rebuking or uh, taking our stand, God, where you would address the enemy today in Jesus' name saying, get behind them, Satan, and that there, there would be an exchange for what we see in the human realm, in the natural realm, to what your purposes are in the kingdom realm. Today, in Jesus' name, we pray. And so, God, I thank you that as your spirit moves today, that only you can do what you need to do. And so, God, right now, we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you that you forgive us, that you make right, Father God, that you are above all and you deserve all of our attention. And so, Father, I thank you that even as we worship right now, you will do a work in our hearts. Amen.